sources of funding, and, and they think that, that payment stream system services is an interesting way to do that. However, at the most recent discussions on this specific topic, which were held in October last year, um, this concept of IPS itself was not at all presented or discussed during the negotiations, which I was fortunate enough to follow. However, um, just that the general idea of using innovative financing mechanisms, of going beyond usual channels of, of, of financing biodiversity through official development assistance was not unanimous, unanimously supported. This obviously fits into the broader context of international negotiations on the environment between donor countries and recipient countries um, who, who are obviously uh, wrestling over, over the way that that money is, is, is spent with um, the donor com countries being particularly keen to find alternatives to existing mechanisms such as the Global Environment Facility. They are keen to uh, complement um, public finance with, with more innovative tools of private finance and the recipient countries that want the donor countries to honor their commitments and um, to basically use the official channels but use them better and, and uh, have more sustainable financing. So there's that dynamics going on there. Within that context, there was quite a bit of discussion on what do we do with innovative financing mechanisms. Some countries want it in, mainly the donor countries, others don't. And there was no consensus there. The decision was, we do more research and we come back in two years and decide if this is something that, that we want. So again, as, as has been as happened in the lead up to Nagoya, we're still trying to put forward different ideas and to show how payments for ecosystem services, how things like biodiversity offsets, how markets for, for carbon credits can help implement the, the CBD, the, the biodiversity agenda. And I, I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that we're, we're, not, we're not quite there in terms of having payments for ecosystem services accepted as a, a legitimate means of, of mobilizing resources to implement the CBD. So the political consensus is still quite a, a, a thorny issue. Now, how can we make PES, which is a popular theme, which people talk about, the New York example, people talk about examples in Costa Rica, uh, people talk about the carbon markets, there are definitely some success stories out there on how this model of payments for ecosystem services has worked, but what does it mean for it to be implemented at the international level? Um, and so here we still face a few challenges in terms of figuring out what PES means internationally. Are we just going to put the word international at the beginning of the definition I presented uh, by Sven Wunder saying, you know, it's, it's a tra an international transaction whereby an international ecosystem service, or what really makes it stand out? And so there's two, um, two approaches to what is meant by international payments for ecosystem services. We're talking about greater volume of payments, and again focused on sort of the, the distance as, as we have in, in the carbon market where the beneficiaries and the providers are, are far removed from each other or do we mean using the basic PS model that we have for the management of, of water related services so for, for so the hydroelectric facility the, the drinking water the, the filtration services and then finding ways of, of scaling that up at the international level maybe creating a global market for local of the, these type of schemes. Um, so those are sort of the two, I would say, main leads that, that, that discussions on international payment for ecosystem services have followed. And as I said, there's been a, a bit of, of confusion with, with, with regards to how PS, uh, which is understood as a basic model operating at, at the local level, could work uh, globally, at, at a global scale. Here we see um, Different benefits. Um, I think this is so. Uh, this is from from forest ecosystem service and, and broken down in terms of uh, the, the beneficiaries, where they are, local communities, national level, international, global, global communities. So this is just to reinforce the message that when, when we have a specific area, a specific protected area, uh, a community forest, whichever ecosystem we're talking about, it has different values depending. On uh, from the perspective of different stakeholders. Um, the water-related benefits tend to be more local. Um, the biodiversity global good. Here we don't have the, the, the carbon uh, 
value, but that would be very much in line with biodiversity conservation, applying at, at the global community. And we also have a conceptual mismatch. Um, I think this is, this is important to, to understand that when we have this concept of ecosystem services being put to the, to the forefront and, and showed as, as a new way of communicating about our dependencies on, on, on the natural environment for human well-being, we're talking about it in these more scientific terms of the different types of, of benefits and different types of ecosystem services. But when it comes time to operationalizing this and, and really developing markets for these different types of, of ecosystem services, the language changes slightly. And we're used to talking about carbon markets, water markets, biodiversity markets. And that is the problem is that biodiversity is not in itself an ecosystem service. It doesn't really fit into that uh, framework as, as we have in, in the, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. It's, it's somewhere even more upstream than the supporting services. Um, so if your agenda, as, as is with the CBD, is really one of finding incentives to conserve biodiversity using the PES approach, you have a bit of a conceptual problem there in terms of figuring out where does biodiversity fit in. It's not in itself an ecosystem approach, so it's sort of an indirect result of getting incentives if people are paying for water filtration, if people are paying for carbon sequestration, then indirectly they're conserving biodiversity, but you don't always get uh, sort of the, 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 the type of benefits that, that you would expect if you're, if you're so concerned with biodiversity. We'll get into that a, a bit later. Um, now, what are the different strategies? So we've seen the different sort of approaches uh, the different uh, justifications for how IPS um, should be developed, the fact that it's building on payments for ecosystem services, a popular concept, it's implementing the, the mandate of the CBD, we're trying to, to get similar solutions to biodiversity than what we've had with carbon. So one of the main strategies basically was to take that reflection further and say, well listen, the carbon market exists at a global scale, more and more we're talking about forest-based carbons, we're talking about reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. Um, that is obviously a, a, a no-lose strategy for biodiversity. If forests are going to be increasingly integrated into the international carbon markets, then we're going to get a benefit. And that's been how these red discussions have been largely influenced by the biodiversity community uh, itself. Um, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to note at the, at the time that this IPS concept came, it was, so this is about 2006, it was only in December 2007 that the concept of RED was officially recognized by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change as a potential mitigation option. Um, and I think it's, obvious, it's not a surprise that IPS as a concept has maybe not been so prominent since then that in a way RED came over and there we have it. We have a mechanism international level that is giving us biodiversity benefits by building on the carbon market. Um, and so you can see the literature has just really literally exploded. We have atlases that are shown where carbon and biodiversity overlap. Um, we're showing different instances on, on how these incentives for, for avoiding deforestation can, in some cases, support biodiversity, in other cases, maybe not so much. But overall, it's, it's a pretty clear assessment that if more forests or more ecosystems are going to be integrated into an international incentive scheme, we're going to get biodiversity benefits. Maybe I didn't explain this slide too well. The reason I put a train there is the locomotive is meant to, to uh, represent the, basically the, the international carbon market, climate change as being the most prominent feature on the international environmental agenda, and <coughs> really, in my view, symbolizes well how this red discussion has evolved in terms of the different other agenda items of the international environmental community, biodiversity, uh, watershed management, or, or, and, and obviously livelihoods, ha have really tried to keep up with the locomotive and, and make sure that it is headed in the right direction and that we have the right safeguards in place for biodiversity conservation, for equity, for, for, for rural development um, in a sense. Um, so at this stage I think we really have been moving ahead 
with red, but we're really not sure if it, if it is going to work. And the evolution has gone here, as I tried to show in the gradient at the bottom, from simply thinking about avoided deforestation to a double D deforestation and forest degradation, ecosystem degradation, red plus, and conservation of, of, of carbon stocks. Um, and, and the scope is becoming increasingly wide, and now we're talking about reducing emissions from all types of land uses, um, basically that, that carbon incentives are not just to provide, to conserve forest, but basically biomass in, in the broader sense, so agroforestry fits into that, into the scheme as well. So we have different interests, foresters, agroforesters, agriculturalists, even those working in dry lands, wetlands, different types of ecosystems all, all have, have a stake. So it's a very complicated picture out there with red. Um, but overall, the, the, the benefit for, for biodiversity, although indirect, um, is, is, is something that, that, that we can count on. But there's also limits to this red mechanism. And, and I've been following these discussions over the, over the past years, um, since Bali, um, and, and prior and afterwards. Um, and it's, it's difficult to really get a sense if this is something that, that, that actually could work. The main issue, obviously, being that global beneficiaries of the Carbon Sequestration Ecosystem Service have an interest in, in forest conservation, um, but the local uh, beneficiaries of ecosystem services have a different view on the forest, and it's not, for them, the carbon benefits come after their sources of food, their sources of water, of building material, and so if we are creating incentives for conservation of forests in the name of climate change in the name of preserving the global public good, we need to be very careful not to compromise um, access, to, access to those resources for those who really depend on them for, for their livelihoods. And so I think there's a lot of legitimate concerns currently in, in these discussions on red on, on how do we uh, manage the global beneficiaries, <laughs> their, their needs with obviously the more important uh, needs of those who, who have a direct dependence on these ecosystems. So the balance between uh, locally enjoyed ecosystem services and global ecos globally enjoyed ecosystem services still um, is a source of conflict and more negotiation is, is certainly needed to ensure that we get we get this right. I don't want to get yeah, I don't want to get into to the, the the red discussion too much. It really is is quite a. A complicated, a complicated uh, scene out there. I'm um, happy to discuss ap after the after the meeting um, with those of you who have a bit more interest in that particular topic. So there's the strategy of piggybacking on the carbon market through red, um, and then related to that, where where we're basically with red, it's just well, we're going to get our biodiversity benefits through carbon. Another way of looking at it is we're going to bundle our biodiversity benefits with the other types of of benefits that we get for for ecosystem preservation or sound ecosystem management. Um, so in this respect, we're looking at it more from the landscape, seeing it as a provider of different types of ecosystem services, and therefore as an asset that has different, that is a bundle of services or a bundle of goods, a bundle of, of values. Um, and the biodiversity is going to be one of those values, and actually one that provides um, perhaps the, the most important um, attribute in terms of the, the quality of the landscape. Um, so the, the, the main limitation with, with bundling, with this idea of being able to market a landscape for the different attributes that it has, to, to, to market a landscape as one that, that provides water, carbon, biodiversity, other types of benefits is very attractive, but it also has its limits. There has been recent research on um, sort of the trade-offs that we have between the different types of ecosystem services and showing how they're not always positively correlated, meaning that we're not, if we, aren't, if we want to incentivize all of them, the full bundle of them, then we might have to settle for not so optimal uh, results, where, where, whereas if we were those that would be, for example, interested in water will have to be compromising with, 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 with different types of interests. And we find, obviously, that there is...